All right, hello everyone. Uh, thanks for attending today's webinar, the world's oldest living MADCAP Flare project. Study on project architecture. My name is Paul. I am with uh, MADCAP Software. Let's just kind of get into this thing. <clears throat> Before we really get started, a couple of quick things. One is to let you know that this webinar is going to be recorded. It's being recorded and uh, everybody will get and uh, who registers will get an email for that. So that's really nice because during it, you might be thinking, oh, what do you say? I missed that. Um, you can always go back <clears throat> and listen in case you think you missed something. The other thing is feel free to ask questions throughout uh, using the question panel. Uh, I'm not gonna see the questions as we go. So if you ask a question and you're wondering why I don't stop and answer your questions because I'm not even gonna see them until the end, um, my coworker Rachel will be uh, gathering all the questions and we'll have time for a short question and answer at the very end. And a lot of times what happens is we run out of time <clears throat> to go through all the questions, but we do answer all of them. We will uh, we'll, uh, gather them all together, put them into a document, all the questions and answers. So <clears throat> I will answer your, your question. If I don't know the answer, I'll find someone who knows the answer. And if I can't find someone who knows the answer, we'll just fake it. But we will answer your questions. <clears throat> all right, so what is this um, seminar, with this webinar, what is this all about? Well, <clears throat> it's about the documentation. It's about the design of your documentation universe, how it's all put together. Uh, yes, Flair is, it's at the center of it, how you can structure the inside of your projects, all of that. But it's more than just Flare projects. It's also about other tools, systems, processes that you might use around Flare. It's, it's your universe. Uh, I'm going to take you through different options that are available. Uh, we'll go through pros and cons of those options. And all along the way, I'll talk about what we do at MADCAP in the world's oldest living Flare project. Um, see, I'm a dog person and I, uh, sometimes I have to take my dogs to the vet. It's usually, it turns out it's something gross, really gross that they ate. And I will, the, the vet will say, well, you, you, here's your options, a, option A, B, C, or D. And I almost always say, well, what would you do? Because I figure she's a vet and she has dogs. And so this webinar is sort of my way of saying, well, look, here's some options that you have. And this is what I do. One thing to keep in mind as we go through this, though, is to realize that one size does not fit all. If you were to call tech support here at MADCAP and you ask them, hey, how should I structure all my stuff? They're probably going to start by saying, well, it depends. And that's the correct answer. Um, they're not trying to be difficult or evasive or anything like that. They're, they're telling you the truth. There is, there is no one best way to build your documentation universe because my needs might be different from your needs and your needs might be different from the person next to you. Um, yes, there are recommendations we have, there are best practices here and there, but it's, it's really about choosing the things that fit your situation the best. We have new features that we release all the time, but um, you know, even though I, I, I write from Madcap, that doesn't mean I use them all. I pick and choose the things that fit my situation the best. Also realize that your documentation universe, your architecture, is usually, it's usually not static. It's a living, breathing thing that changes over time. When new features or new technology comes along or you just gather more knowledge and experience, you tend to react and implement the things that uh, improve your architecture. So the way that I set things up and the way that I do things now, it looks a whole lot different from the way I did them 13 years ago. <clears throat> there is a lot to cover in this, so if you miss something or you want more details than I'm giving in this session, uh, just know that I've added all of this stuff I'm talking about, plus a whole lot more to the Flare Server Online Help. You just go in there and search for the word architecture, and you're going to find this topic. There's, there's tons of stuff in here, um, stuff that I'm talking about today and a whole lot more that I don't have time to talk about today. And if you prefer to see it all in a PDF, you just click that button with the check mark in the upper right corner and 
by the way, that's true of most topics in the online help. Not a lot of people know this. If you see that button with a check mark, it means that the topic you have open is associated with a PDF that you can download by clicking that button. And there are even some topics in the help, such as um, topics about styles, where you'll also see a little button up there with a sort of a plus symbol. And that means you can click it and open a cheat sheet. So, and a cheat sheet is just a really short PDF, a couple of pages long that gives you quickie information on on the most basic stuff. That's not really important for the webinar, but because I'm showing this on the screen, I thought I'd pass it along as an FYI. I wanna start uh, with what I call external architecture. This has to do with your Flare projects as entities, how they might relate to one another, and many of the tools uh, and processes that you might also need to work with outside of a project. These are the pieces of external architecture that I'm covering in this webinar, those two things there. To me, those are two of the most important things. And these are the things that I also wanted to talk about and I originally put in here, but I don't have time to talk about because this is only an hour long webinar, not gonna get through those, but don't worry. Um, like I said before, anything I don't talk about in this webinar, all these things that you see here in the black text, I do talk about in the online help, in the project architecture section and in much greater detail than I would go into here anyway. And that includes how I approach all of these areas in MADCAP's documentation. So <clears throat> we're going to start talking about Flare project structures. Uh, this has to do with how many Flare projects you might create, one project, a few projects, many projects, whatever you decide to do. It also has to do with how those projects relate to each other, if they relate to each other at all. Well, we'll start out with the simplest structure of all. One project, you generate output from it. It really doesn't get much simpler than that. So yeah, it's very simple. You only have one project. There's, there's less to coordinate and manage. <clears throat> You're also putting all of your documentation into one project, so it's easy. You know where everything is. Those are good things. But on the other hand, if you have multiple writers working in this one project, you probably need to be using a source control uh, system, which we're going to talk about in a bit. If you're not using source control and you have multiple writers on the same project, this structure probably isn't the best way to go. Also, um, if you are putting all of your documentation into one project, and just know that if it turns into a ton of documentation, that you've just got tons and tons of it, a really large project can become overwhelming. And a really large project can also affect performance. It can slow things down. Keep that in mind. You could also have this kind of structure <clears throat> where you have multiple Flare projects, but they don't have any relationship to one another. They're just individual projects. Each one produces output. Okay, again, this is a really simple structure. Uh, and if you have more than one writer, this can actually be nice because each writer can work independently in her, his or her own project. So you're not worrying too much about making conflicting changes to the same files. If you break things up uh, from one big project into multiple smaller projects, you might experience better performance. <clears throat> and, and by the way, when it comes to performance, keep in mind that there are several things that can cause performance problems if you notice your project slow. So it could be the hardware you're using. It could be you have live spell checking enabled. Maybe you have too many files and window panes open. That happens a lot to people. All kinds of things can affect it. Um, but breaking it up can generally improve the performance. So that's good. <clears throat> However, um, same thing with the other structure. If you're going to have more than one writer working in the same project, you really should be using source control. Also, because you have multiple projects, you might want those projects to have some of the same characteristics, such as the same style sheet, so that all your projects look and feel the same. Well, if you go with this structure, it's not so good for that, because you'd have to maintain something like uh, a style sheet in multiple projects instead of just one place, so you're not single sourcing. Here's a structure that would solve that last, prob that last problem, um, multiple projects that are using global project linking. So global project linking 
it's simply a feature where you've got one or more Flare projects that are importing files from another Flare project. But it's not just about importing. It's about this ongoing connection that exists between the parent project and the child projects. So any files that are part of the import, you'd still keep maintaining them in one place, up, up in the parent project. And then to keep the child projects up to date, you'd periodically re-import those files. So this diagram shows one way to do it. With the child projects you see down here, they're each uh, producing output. But you could also do something like this. This is another option where the parent project also could be generating output. Or you could have something more complex with multiple parent projects. Uh, you can imagine that there's all kinds of different ways that you could configure this. It's really just up to your imagination. So a structure with global project linking, it can be really great because you're able to single source files across projects. You're able to leverage them from one place. It's, uh, it's also nice because you can have multiple authors working in different projects and they're able to leverage some of those common files. With global project linking, the imports, they can happen manually um, or they can happen automatically. So if manually you just go in there and you to the child project and you just click the button, re-import whenever you want. Um, but you can also set it up so that files are automatically re-imported anytime you build output from the child project. So that's really nice. Uh, there are different ways that you can import. You have your a choice. You can do it by file names, you can do it by file types or conditions that are on files um, or combination. In most cases, when I do it, I happen to like to import by conditions. Um, <clears throat> the main thing I would caution you about with global project linking is what I call the threshold. And I would also, also caution you uh, about what I call the domino effect. So to explain what I mean by the threshold and the domino effect, I'll tell you a little bit about how global project linking originally came into being. So you have to rewind <clears throat> back to 2005 when Flare version one was first in development. Um, <laughs> there wasn't too much to it back then. Uh, and I started writing the documentation in June. Uh, so I knew I was writing about Flare using Flare. And so I created a project and I named it Flare. That's the oldest living Flare project. And I started documenting it over the months as we added features. And we eventually uh, released, I want to say in February of 2006, something like nine months later. And within an hour after we pushed the button to make it all live, uh, the head developer guy, he, he says to me, OK, now you got to start working on documentation for capture. And of course, I said, well, what's capture? And he goes, well, that's that's going to be our screen capture tool. OK, <laughs> all right. So I create a second Flare project and I name it Capture and I'm start documenting. While I'm doing this, then he tells me, OK, now you also have to start working on Mimic. Well, what's Mimic? That's our movie making tool. OK, so three projects. Now I have three Flare projects, Cap Flare, Capture, Mimic, and then eventually Lingo, uh, our translation tool. So I've got four projects. And at this point, I go time out, hold on, wait a second. This something it's this isn't making sense because, for one thing, there's some things that I want these projects to have in common. Like I want them to have the same style sheet, same skins, uh, some of the same images, different things like that. So I had a couple of choices. One is I could put everything into one big big project, or we come up with a feature to solve this. So they came up with a feature, and we called it Global Project Linking. And so I started importing uh, from my, my first project, the Flare one, into the other ones, things that I wanted to be in common. But what happened is the way I originally envisioned it was I was mostly going to be importing uh, support files, ancillary files, like my, my resource files, style sheets, skins, uh, maybe some project files. But what happened, and, the, and that's not to say that you can't import other things, but any type of file that's in a Flare project you can import into another one. Um, but the thing is, uh, I started importing topics and snippets too, which is fine. But the 
thing is, uh, topics and snippets are, those kinds of files tend to have links to other topics and snippets. And so you kind of need to import those things too. So it kind of goes on and on, that's a domino effect. Before you know it, you end up with a ton of files and you come up against what I call the threshold where it may not make sense to do it like that anymore. So once I got to the point where I was importing something like 70% of my files, I go, I'm not sure that this makes sense for me to do it this way. And I made a decision uh, to put all of my files into one big project. Uh, <clears throat> so I can't tell you what your threshold is if you decide to use global project linking. Maybe it's 50%, 70%, 90%, I don't know. You just have to, to, to try it out, make a decision. Does this make sense for me or doesn't it? Now, 2018, I still use global project linking as you're gonna see in a little bit, but I use it in a couple of different ways than I originally started out doing. So there's just a little bit of history there for you to give you some context. So here's another structure with multiple projects. It's kind of the opposite of global project linking, it's project merging. So what you're doing here is you're writing in these, these individual little child projects down here, and then up you have a master project that you set up and you have a TOC that points to each of these child projects. So when you build output from the master project, it sucks in all the content from the child projects and it looks like one seamless output from just one big project, but it's actually output that's made up from multiple projects. And a lot of people like this structure, they do this. <clears throat> It's a, the, this structure is really easy to set up um, and multiple, in most cases it is. Uh, most, uh, multiple authors uh, can be working independently in their own projects and you're able to leverage all of their content in the output, so that's good. Uh, and because multiple authors can work in independent projects, uh, you, you can avoid conflicts, file conflicts, so that's good. But keep in mind, that whoever is in charge of that master project, they have to have access to those child projects or at least the output from those child projects. So you have to work that out, uh, how you're going to, to make that available. Also, you gotta consider links between topics. So let's say you have a cross-reference in, in a topic in one of your child projects and you want it to point to a topic in another child project. Well, you can do that, that's possible, but it does take some extra time and effort to set that up. It's not nearly as easy as just doing it in the same project. Uh, if you want your projects to say to share some of the same files when you're when you're authoring, this structure, like your style sheet, your, this structure by itself isn't going to solve that problem. <clears throat> Another downside is that HTML5 side and top navigation outputs. And those are the outputs, those are our most popular outputs because they're they look cool and they're just pretty neat. They they don't support project merging right now. So if you really want to use project merging, you'd have to use one of the other kinds of outputs. And finally, if you happen to create synonyms in your child projects, uh, those won't get merged across the, all of the outputs. They stay with the output that has to do with each child project. And so it's not a real big thing, but it's one thing to keep in mind. Here's another structure <clears throat> with multiple projects that is somewhat similar to project merging. This is multilingual output. You would use this if you need to have your project translated into multiple languages. So for example, in this diagram, this uh, master project up here, uh, maybe that one is written in English, and then you have a separate copy of that project that down here translated into French, and another one translated into German, and a third one translated into Japanese. And then in your master project, you point to each of those translated projects and you generate the output. And then and so in the end, in the output, you'd have one collection of output, but it's in four different languages. Uh, this structure, <clears throat> believe it or not, is actually really easy to set up. It's great um, if you have multiple translators because they can each be working in their own projects instead of translating in the same project, stepping on each other. Uh, it's uh, supported in both online and PDF outputs. It's actually really pretty cool when you see the end result of this. But 
uh, one thing to keep in mind about multilingual output is that you have to make sure that the files in the projects have the same file names. Uh, you don't want a translator going into their project and changing any of the file names or it's not going to work. Uh, if you're using Madcap Lingo, if you're the author coordinating this and, you, and you're using Madcap Lingo to coordinate everything, this really shouldn't be an issue, but I'm just saying keep it in mind. The other thing that uh, to know is that the Flare author does have to have Lingo installed on their computer in order to merge all of this stuff together. So those are some common structures. And then a lot of people, what they do is they might use a combination of the different structures. For example, maybe you decide you want to use global project linking, but also project merging. You could do that. You could set up something like what you see here. Or maybe you create a, project, a structure that has project merging and multilingual output. You do both. It's really up to you. You just have to consider all these different structures, what you want to accomplish, put them together in a way that makes sense for you. So what do we do at Madcap Software? We do this. We do global project linking with the parent project also producing output. However, like I said before, we don't always use global project linking in exactly the same way that, that I originally started using it. 13 years ago. I use it in a couple of different ways. Um, as I mentioned ago, there was there was a point um, several years ago where I decided to take all of my individual projects and just kind of put all the files into one big project. So we have this really large Flare project that serves as the parent. This is the project that um, when, when I refer to the world's oldest living Flare project, the first one I created back in 2005, that I named Flare, that's what this is, this parent project up here. Um, but I added the other files from the other projects into it and I renamed this thing. It started out being named uh, Flare and I renamed it Shared because it had everything in it. And from that project, we generate the vast majority of our output. It's all the output that, that you guys see. But from our shared project, there's also some, ch some child projects that we use for a couple of different reasons. Um, and we generate output from those projects too, but it's generally output that we use for internal purposes in our company. Uh, more, this is a more specific diagram that shows what we actually do. Uh, so that large long box at the top, uh, our main project, that's the one that I called shared. And you see all those icons in it. These icons represent the different Madcap software products that I have to document, Flare, Central, Lingo, so on. So <clears throat> all of the documentation, like I said, for all those products is in that, in, in that big project and all the output that the general public sees that you guys see is generated from there. But we also have those child projects below. So this, this middle one down here in, in, in the bottom, this internal project, that's our documentation Bible. I've always had a documentation Bible. And this is internal documentation that talks about how we do documentation. At, at MADCAP. It's all of our standards, our rules and procedures, our style guides, stuff like that. Well, this project is using global project linking in the same way, pretty much the same way that it was originally intended all those years ago. Most of the editing is done directly in that internal project in the documentation Bible. Uh, but there are some supporting files like style sheets, page layouts, variables, all that, that um, we maintain up here in the shared project and I want to bring them in so that it, this is consistent with everything else. <clears throat> so that's one of our child projects. Then you see this box down here in the lower left it says develop projects. This is probably the hardest thing for me to explain in this webinar because I just I really don't have time to do it justice but basically these are smaller projects each one based on one of our Madcap products. So I have one called Central Develop, another called Lingo Develop, and so on. And what I do is I just import all of the files for that that are uh, pertinent to that particular product from the shared project down into a child project. And I do it based on conditions. It's the easiest way for me to do it. Now, I don't do any editing at all in any of these child projects. Um, <clears throat> the reason I have these at all is for doing things like task management and internal outputs. These child projects, they're basically versions of the documentation as it's being developed, not the finished result. I'll repeat that because it's really important. 
These child projects are versions of the documentation as it's being developed, not the finished result. It really has a lot to do with source control and specifically with branching, which is what I'm gonna talk about next. So hopefully as I talk about those things, this box will make a little bit more sense to you. The other thing I'll tell you about those developed child projects is they're a workaround. Um, sometimes you just don't have all the features yet to do exactly what you want to do, ideally. So you create workarounds. And as, as the years have gone by, I've had less and less workarounds, fewer and fewer, because, um, because we get more and more features. But sometimes I still have workarounds, and that's what this is. This is a workaround. Now, all of these child projects, both the develop projects and the documentation Bible, we uh, bind these. We upload these to Madcap Central. Uh, which is our cloud-based platform. It has some really cool stuff in it that I want to take advantage of. So I upload those to Central, and from Central I generate output. But in my case, um, like I said, these child projects, it's it's not for public consumption. Um, we're creating output for internal purposes there. Now, <clears throat> let's move on to this other piece of external architecture that we've got time to talk about, uh, source control. And I wanted to make sure I talk about source control in today's webinar because it's a, it's an especially vital part of my documentation universe, and chances are it, it is for yours too. So for anyone who isn't that familiar with source control, it's it's not as mysterious as it might sound. Each writer has a local copy of a Flare project, and it's mapped to a copy of that project up on a server, and you keep your files synchronized between these copies, which is that makes it especially useful if you've for multiple writers on the same project. Keep everybody's stuff synchronized. Now, Flare isn't doing the source control itself. Instead, what you do is you integrate uh, with a third-party source control tool. And there are lots of source control um, tools on the market. There's uh, Microsoft TFS, there's Git, Perforce, Subversion, just, just to name a few of the main ones. A lot of people have a preference for one or over the other. Um, just ask them, they'll tell you if they like their source control tool or not. I happen to really like Git. I started out using Microsoft SourceSafe years ago, which was horrible, um, made my life terrible. And then I moved up to Microsoft TFS, which was better, but still wasn't great. Uh, now I use Git and I really like it. In addition to these third-party tools, <clears throat> you have the option of binding a Flare project with Madcap Central, and that's, an, that's really an entirely different webinar. Um, but basically, Central uses Git behind the scenes. And so if you do this, you can, when you, when you are using Central, you can use a single-bound model or a dual-bound dual model. Real quickly, what's that mean? Well, a single-bound model, you're not using any other source control tool uh, with your Flare project. You're just bound to Central, and that's your source control solution. And, and Git is working behind the scenes to, to synchronize all these files. Well, some people might be using one of these other third-party tools and you wanna keep using it. And you can still bind your project to Central and take advantage of all the stuff that's up there. If you do that, you'd be using what's called a dual bound model. And you'd have the first binding to whatever tool you decide to use. That's this uh, whole part on the on the left, the step one. And you just keep you just use source control like you like you would normally use it. And then it and then you'd have this second binding to central. And at some point you would push. You get your files all synchronized, and at some point somebody on your team would push the files up to central using that that second binding. Now let's talk a little bit about branching, go a little bit deeper into source control here. Branching, which I alluded to just a little bit ago. So <clears throat> branching is it's where you can work in different versions of the same project. In this diagram that I have here on the right, those vertical lines represent different branches. So for example, <clears throat> you can have uh, a master branch, and that's the one you see here with the blue dots, that line right there. And that's the version of your project that is currently published for everyone to see, all your end users to see. Maybe the current version of your company's product 
uh, is version three, let's say. So this branch has documentation for version three, but it doesn't have documentation that you're working on next for version four. That's what the release branch would be for. That's the one here with these green dots that you see. <clears throat> um, that branch has the documentation for the next upcoming publication of your output. So in this example, it would be version four. Then you might have several feature branches. Those are the ones you see here with all the orange dots. Uh, <clears throat> and these, uh, each of these can be a version of your project dedicated to writing about a new feature you're working on. Eventually, the idea is those um, are going to become part of, that documentation is gonna be part become part of the release branch, but you want to keep them separate for now until you know for sure that they're they're gonna that they should be moved there. You don't want to uh, put all this all these features yet in the release branch prematurely because your boss might come up to you one day and say, hey, we decided to put um, feature X into the next release. We're gonna hold back and wait until version five to to let that go <clears throat> and if that happened and you already did all the documentation you'd have to go in and pull it out or put conditions on it or something terrible like that and that's a real pain and that's why branching is so nice and when you're certain absolutely certain that a certain feature is going to be part of the next release what you do is you just merge it up into the release branch and then uh, at the point um, <clears throat> where your company officially releases the product for the new version, you merge the release branch up into the master branch. So now the master branch becomes version four and you start working on the next stuff and the branch release branch becomes version five and you just kind of rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat for the next uh, release cycle. So basically, uh, branching is a way of keeping your ongoing documentation in, into different buckets. <clears throat> uh, now, um, different source control tools might handle branching differently from one another. I really like how Git does it. It's not multiple copies of a Flare project. It's one project. It's the same project, just different versions of it. So when you open one branch, you're going to see the full project, but you'll also see files and edits that are specific to that particular branch. And if you open a, up a different branch, you're going to see the full project, but you're going to have some stuff that's unique just to that branch. So for most people, branching can be kind of intimidating at first, but once you start using it and it clicks in your head, you'll go, oh, this is cool. And it's really not as scary as it first sounds. Uh, branching is it's also the best thing that I've come across if you're a Flare author working with an agile workflow. Um, not that I'm any kind of an expert on agile methodology. I'm not. I'm not an agile expert. I'm not a scrum lord. Um, I uh, somebody's got a message down there. I um, you know I don't I don't know the secret handshake. I don't uh, and any of that stuff. But uh, it just makes sense to me that um, th that if I were working in an agile a development that I would want to use that. It makes sense to me. So source control, it's an efficient way for multiple writers to work on the same project. You're synchronizing everyone's changes with the local, with the copy of the project on the server and you resolve any file conflicts that you might have with other users. I think it's really good not only for teams of writers, but for lone writers too. In all the years that I've worked as a lone writer, I use source control because it's a great way to keep a backup of your project in case something happens to your computer. You know, a polar bear might eat your computer. You don't know. Uh, another good thing is that if you bind your project to central using the single bound model, the process is really simple. I mean, it's so simple, it's stupid. Just a couple of clicks. I love it. Very easy to set up. On the other hand, if you bind a third party tool to a Flare project. It's a little bit more work to get it set up. You got to get information from your system administrator. You got to enter everything just right. If one little thing is off, it won't, it won't work. So it's just a little bit harder. Uh, there's also a little bit of a learning curve with source control, source control systems. Some people might say a big <laughs> learning curve. You got to learn the steps that you do every day. You got to learn the terminology for whatever provider you choose. So just keep that in mind. 
and uh, you might experience some slowdown. This is something that affects performance. A project that is not bound to source control typically runs faster than a project that is using source control. Okay, so here's what we do with uh, source control. Remember, <clears throat> at MADCAP, we, I'm, I'm using three different kinds of projects. First, there's that, that main project that I call shared. Uh, in addition to Flare, we also use Central because there's so many cool and useful things that you can, you can do with it. So that's why uh, I use a dual binding on this project with Central. The first binding is to Git, and we do that because I like Git and it supports branching that I just talked about. To be more specific, we use a system called Gitflow. You can, you can look it up on the internet. Uh, there's this guy who developed uh, this system. Uh, and I, sh I really showed you this just a little bit ago when I showed you that diagram that had all those vertical lines representing branches. So Gitflow, is, is, I found it to be a really great system for parallel development where you keep your, your new development separate from the finished documentation. So that's the first binding. Um, but then we have this second binding to central and Git is running behind the scenes there too. So we kind of had this Git, Git model. It's Git squared, I guess. Now, why don't we just use a single bound model and just connect it directly to central? Well, the reason is that central doesn't support branching just yet. When it supports it, if and when uh, central supports branching, I'm going to drop that first binding and go directly to central. So our second kind of project in, um, <clears throat> that we use is our documentation Bible. And this project, we single bind that to central. And that's the reason why I do that is because we don't need to use branching with that project. So I just do the simple thing and bind it directly. <clears throat> then third, remember we have those develop projects. Remember from the diagram a, a little bit ago, it's, the, it's these projects down here on the lower left. Um, the truth is that if central supported branching, I wouldn't be creating these child projects at all. I'd just be pushing different branches up to central and dealing with things there. But unfortunately, that's not an option for me right now. Uh, so see, the thing is, I'm not going to stop using branching. It's important to me, but there are also things on central I really need to use. So I created this workaround. And each of these projects, again, is a result of global project linking. Um, and they are single bound to central um, because uh, the, the, the branching already happened up in the shared project, so I don't need to use that. So they're just single bound and I'm getting the correct content up there in to central. So when we use branching in our main shared project that I just talked about, not only do we have the, we use the master release and those feature branches, but we also create this kind of special branch that we, we named develop. Um, it's basically a, a version of the big project that's sort of, it's kind of like a sandbox. It's, it consolidates all of our new documentation. It takes, we, we put all of our, our feature branches, all that stuff into one branch. So it's all kind of consolidated there. So it's all that new stuff that's in a state of development. And all of these developed child projects are based on that branch. So whenever I import, files from my main shared project into one of these develop child projects, I always make sure I have the, the develop branch checked out first. So <clears throat> these projects, they, they let us see the files as it's in development rather than the final thing. And because of that, we use these projects, these child projects for things like task management, checklists, internal outputs. Those are things that Central does really well. Um, we don't do any editing in those projects. Like I said, their whole purpose is internal project management. And remember how I said that your architecture is it's a living, breathing thing, not static. Well, this is a good example because the second that central supports branching, if and when it does, I'm not going to be using this anymore. I won't have any further need to create these child develop projects. And at that point, my architecture, it's going to change. It's going to be simplified once more. Okay. So everyone take a deep breath because I know that's a lot of stuff um, that I threw at you. Some people might be more beginners, some intermediate, some advanced, um, and your head might be spinning from some of that. That subject on source control and branching has a tendency to do that. 
And I could do a session all that day that lasts, uh, a session that lasts all day just on our branching process, but obviously I don't have time for that. But here's what I've done. Um, I thought, okay, if I were sitting there watching this webinar, what would I want? And I wanted more information. Well, we have an internal PDF at MADCAP uh, that, that I created and it explains all of this source control stuff. This is from our documentation Bible. Um, it, just, it, it explains all this source control and the branching stuff in detail. I talk about concepts, reasons why we do things in a certain ways. There's step-by-step -step procedures in there. There's screenshots, daily tasks, all of that stuff. So if you're really, really interested in learning more about our actual um, source control and branching processes at MADCAP, here's the PDF. It's I, I've, I've never put any of our internal stuff out there before uh, until now, but here it is. Help yourself. Uh, if you don't, it's docs.madcapsoftware.com slash doc team slash source control dot PDF. If you don't write this, have time to write this uh, URL down, that's fine. Just go to the online help like I showed you in the beginning where I talk about all the project architecture stuff. And this link is in there and it'll be in there so you won't lose it. Now. That is the external stuff. That was going to be the bulk of um, today's session. But I do quickly want to talk a little, switch and talk a little bit about internal architecture. This has to do with the inside of a Flare project, uh, different ways that you can structure the parts of a project. And at the end of this section, I'm going to open our the oldest Flare project in the world, that shared project, and I'll show you the inside of it a little bit. So quickly, here are some things I'm covering in this session, just those three things. And these are things I didn't have time to include, but once again, all that stuff is, is covered in detail in the online help. And I know there's a whole lot more that I could have put into this beyond what I even have here, um, but uh, I had to cut it off at some point or it would never get finished. So let's start with talking about naming conventions. First of all, what do you do about word separation in your folder and file names. Well, there are various ways you can go. You can have spaces, you can run words together, you can use underscores, but hyphens are typically re recommended by a lot of SEO experts. And then there's case. Um, do you use uppercase or lowercase? Because uh, some search engines run on case sensitive servers, so it can make a difference. I would just say that whatever you do choose, uh, try to be consistent with it. How long should folder and file names be? Well, in general, the shorter the better. Uh, that's usually the case, as long as they're not so short that you can't tell what they're about. You also might consider using certain keywords or letters to help organize your folders and files. You can add them to the beginning or end of names for better organization. And finally, it might be obvious, but just make sure you're using meaningful file names, put some thought into it beforehand. I'm not just saying that uh, because if I could go back in time, I would have thought much more about that before I started naming things. And this applies to all types of files, not just topics. Here's what we do. We use hyphens for our folder and file names. For case, we gen generally use initial caps or main words up. And you know, so we capitalize the first letter of the main words. Uh, we try to keep minor words such as articles, the, and a, out of our file names, although sometimes we forget and they get in there. Uh, <clears throat> for some file names, we do use certain keywords or letters. For example, all of our main landing pages start with the word about. It, I found that it just makes it easier to identify them, to find them and identify them. Um, or we might have a bunch of snippets about a particular feature. So we'll start the name of each snippet file with the name of that feature. Like you see here, we just put out a thing, uh, a feature called Elasticsearch in our last release. And so we've got some snippets that are named uh, like that. And then for things like small images, if I'm capturing um, uh, like a button in, in the UI, and it's so that's what the image is. I'll put BTN at the end of the image file name. So that tells me exactly what kind of an image it is without having to open it first. All that being said, uh, even though those are all our standards, this is a really old project, 13 years old. I used to do things one way and then over time I changed. Uh, so this project has been constantly evolving over 13 years. So there are some um, old, there's, um, <clears throat> So there are still some old legacy file names that we're still working on updating as we get the time, but the topic file names 
are what I would be most concerned about. And those in our in our projects, I've pretty much updated all, all of those. So real quickly, talk about folders. This might not, might not even need to be said, but when categorizing folders, figure out what you want to base them on. Is it products, features, subject matter? Um, <clears throat> What, it, what is it? They should be intuitive names that you use consistently. And you can put condition tags on both folders and files. Uh, but what, 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 I, what you'll realize is that you can save a lot of time if you just put the condition on the folder because all the files underneath it will use the same condition. But if you do that, you just you kind of have to be mindful still of potential conflicts. What you want to do is, is try it out and test it out and make sure the conditions are working the way that you, you intended. You can put characters or numbers at the beginning of folder names if you want to force the order that they appear in Flare. Otherwise, they're just going to be alphabetical. So you can do that. So what do we do? Here's what we do. I used to organize all of our folders first by feature. That's what I used to do. But over time, I found it was easier. Um, <laughs> I keep getting messages. Over time, I found it was easier to do it by product than within the product folders, I created more subfolders according to the feature. So this is why it's important that you try to make decisions like this up front so that you, you don't have to spend a lot of time later rearranging things down the road, especially if, if you're bound to source control. And you, once you start renaming and moving and deleting things and a bunch of them, that can turn into a real nightmare with source control. I do put conditions on the folders that are named after a product, it saves me a lot of time because I know, um, <clears throat> it saves me a lot of time because I know that everything under that folder should, gosh, um, <clears throat> I know that everything under that folder is gonna have the conditions. So I don't have to waste time putting conditions on tons of individual files. But even though I separate most things into folders like this, there are some files that are used in more than one product, such as snippets and images. So for those, I have a special folder that I named shared. And under the files, uh, and the files under those have conditions on the files themselves. That's what I do. The last thing that I want to talk about in this section on internal architecture before we get to Q&A has to do with snippets and conditions. If you used Flare for any amount of time, you've probably already figured out that these are two of the most important things when it comes to single sourcing. We would be lost without snippets and conditions. But what I discovered over time is that there are a couple of fundamental ways to structure topics. You can have um, condition focused topics or snippet focused topics. So let's be clear what I what I mean about this. It doesn't mean that you only use conditions or only use snippets in your topics. You're probably going to use both. I use both. I have uh, I have conditions and snippets all over the place. Uh, what it means is which of these elements gets more of the weight or more of the focus in your in your topics. Is it conditions? Or is it snippets? Let me give you an example. <clears throat> Here's a diagram. It represents a topic. And in this topic, I've got content that I've written for three different products, A, B, and C. And I'm going to produce separate output for each of these products. So under the topic heading, you can see I've got five paragraphs here. The first two paragraphs, uh, those have content that should be exactly the same for all three products, A, B, and C. But the final three paragraphs down here are unique to each product. The first paragraph for product A only, the second for product B, the last for product C. So the question is, how do I use single sourcing and keep the content separate for each of these three outputs? <clears throat> well, the first instinct would probably be to make this a condition focused topic. And that's not wrong at all. It's just one way of doing it. So with a condition focused topic, you would have just one topic. Um, and in this topic, you would you would leave the first two paragraphs of regular content alone. They're just, you're not really doing anything to them because all of the outputs should have those. But for the other three paragraphs down here, uh, you'd put a condition on each one, depending on which product should include that paragraph. <clears throat> so I've got a condition on product A, a different one on B, and a different one on C. Then 
in your three targets that you have, you tell Flare which conditions to include or exclude. Well, here's the alternative. Instead of one topic, you could have three snippet-focused topics. Now, at first glance, this might not seem like a good idea because you got three topics when you could have had just one. But it is still using single sourcing because you're using snippets in here. So the first topic, the one at the top, we're going to say this one is going to be used only for product A. So the first two paragraphs in here, uh, we turn those into snippets. And <clears throat> these two snippets here will be inserted into each of these three topics. Under the snippets, we just got regular content, but it's, we only put in the content that's for product A. And then in this topic down here in the lower left, that's uh, the, we do the same thing. We have the same two snippets here for the, that product A has, um, but then this final paragraph is unique just regular content for product B, and then we do the same thing and for this topic over here, for product C. The regular content is just for C, but it has the same two snippets. So which of these approaches is best? Is it condition-focused or snippet-focused? Well, it really depends. Once again, it depends. It depends on your circumstances. For some people, condition-focused is going to be better, but for other people, snippet-focused might be better. Uh, I would argue that the best choice is the one that's it's going to save you the most time and effort and avoid errors. So let's look at each one of these. So the thing about condition-focused topics is that you only need one topic instead of many. So that's definitely a plus. But these kinds of topics can be more confusing to edit, especially if you have lots of conditions. And I've been down this road. If you have a topic with lots and lots of content and lots and lots of conditions on them, you can spend so much time trying to decipher what's going on that you're, you're almost losing the benefit of single sourcing. <clears throat> and with so much going on in one topic, this could lead to errors if you're not careful. And more errors means more time because you have to go back and you gotta fix stuff. Also, uh, depending on how you send files to uh, subject matter experts for review, these kinds of topics can make it easier for those reviewers because they might not have to deal with as many snippets, but at the same time, it can be harder because they might be saying, well, what are all these condition things? <clears throat> so what about snippet-focused topics? Well, you're creating more than one topic, so, you know, bummer but on the bright side, they can be a whole lot easier to edit because they're generally less cluttered. Uh, then there's reviews, kind of the opposite, depending on how you send files for review. These can make it easier because they won't, don't have to deal with all those conditions, but at the same time, it might be harder because people are saying, well, what are all these snippet things that you got in here? So it's not always easy to decide what to do. Here's what we do. Um, I used to use condition-focused topics exclusively. That's how it was for the first several years, but then I switched. Now I typically use snippet-focused uh, topics. Uh, I find them much easier because I have a metric ton of conditions in my project, so the more streamlined I can make the topics, the easier they are to handle. That's especially true if I hire someone, I have to get them up to speed. And because I'm using lots of um, snippets, I create special folders that I name shared, and under these, I store snippets that are used for multiple products. So whew, let's turn our attention now to uh, the world's oldest living flare project. I'll show you the inside here a little bit. So this is, this is it, but quickly before we, we go to a few questions. Um, so this is the inside of our big shared project. Real quickly, a um, few things. I've pinned uh, the most important projects to me here. Uh, if you haven't used pinning in the start page, it's really cool. So these are the ones I go to most often. And then I usually have a lot of test uh, projects where I'm trying things out. In the content folder, you can see, it doesn't look like I have a whole lot of stuff in here because I'm doing these folders based on products. So most of these folders are named after our products and I have got conditions on these. Um, I'll open up Flare. Uh, folder for you and you can see that I have the condition just here. I don't have it anywhere below because they're all going to use this this condition. I've got hyphens, uh, main words up here. Um, if I go down here and look at resources, 
uh, and go into snippets, you're going to see again, I have the same products that got conditions at the that folder level down there. Um, if I look under, uh, go under the central snippets, you can see I got subfolders, but I don't have any conditions on those. But I do have this shared one because I have snippets that are in multiple products. And so if I go down here, the conditions are on actually the um, the files themselves. Now over on the project organizer, if I switch over there, you're going to see, okay, there's no conditions on the folders. Well, why is that? Well, that's because Flare doesn't, it doesn't, uh, oops, it doesn't support that. It doesn't support conditions on folders. In fact, a lot of people have this misconception about conditions in uh, the project organizer. Conditions in the project organizer have no effect on your output whatsoever. The only reason they were added there are for uh, features like global project linking or project exporting. It just makes it easier to select files and import or export them. So I don't have <clears throat> those anywhere. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, I keep losing that. So <clears throat> I'll go in here, expand this. So once again, under here, you can see that it's named by product first. Open up this and you can see I almost exclusively use PDFs and HTML5 as my targets. Now, I opened up this snippet here <clears throat> that we had in the project in the Content Explorer. And you see this one is shared between a couple of um, uh, products. And if I look over here, the link viewer, if you're not using the link viewer, you're missing out. You can open it from view and then link viewer. And I love this thing because it immediately tells me what this thing is linked to. And if I hover over this first one, you can see, oh, that's Flare. Hover over that one, that's Lingo. <clears throat> if I open up that topic, you can see that it's snippet focused. It's, it's a lot of snippets in here. I do have conditions, but it's much, it's cleaner than it would be otherwise. And so it's easier for me to edit. <clears throat> now notice what happened just real quick. Uh, notice that my links changed because I opened up a different file. But here's a little tip for you. Uh, if I go back to that snippet, and now I've got my, my links here again, I can go up and I can lock this thing. And so now if I open up the second topic, these stay in place until I remove the lock. But it's the same thing. This is a different product. Snippet focused topic, snippet heavy, some conditions, but that's essentially what I do. That's a real quick look. Now, we got to go back here and finish up. A uh, couple quick things before short Q&A is uh, we have Mad World Europe coming next month and uh, you can still register. In fact, if you do by August 17th, you can save up to 200 bucks and uh, you can go online to learn about that. And we also have the dates set for Mad World San Diego next year. We are, have put a call out for presentations. If you're interested in that, go online and submit. So. These are my dogs, Gilbert and Mabel, they help me. Every day, Gilbert's in charge of context sensitive help. Mabel just sleeps. So we can take questions now, um, and the rest, like I said, I'll answer later. Uh, so Rachel, um, what do we have? Got any questions that we need to go through? Yeah, we have a couple of questions that came in. Um, if anybody else has any questions, feel free to just add them to the questions panel in the GoToWebinar. Um, the first question is, can you just quickly refresh the audience on what source control tool you use? Okay, so the, the tool that I use again is Git and the interface that I use, now you can use Flare as the interface for that, but I've used Visual Studio for a long time, so and I'm just comfortable with it. So I use Visual Studio, but the source control provider is Git. Perfect. And then how many objects or elements do you have in your main project? <laughs> I get, there's two questions I get asked all the time. That and how many people uh, are on your team? I get asked those all the time. Um, I don't know. Honestly, I don't know how many I have. I have, a, I have a lot. A lot of people think that just, you know, this is the oldest project, so it's, it's just the biggest one in the universe, and it's not because there's other, we have other customers who have, you know, really large teams, and so they have huge projects. It's a large project, but I, I, I don't know. I've never taken the time to really look. I suppose I could figure it out, but I don't know. I, I got asked that at Madworld, too. <laughs> 
Great. Um, is the documentation Bible that you referenced something that you could share? I believe we've done a webinar on this on the past. Yeah, I had a writer a couple years ago. She did a um, she did a webinar and she presented it at Mad World. It was on our documentation Bible, the why we do it and how we do it and everything. And so we don't provide the actual documentation Bible with all the content in it, but we do have the the structure, um, and that's out there. We can get that to you. So it's it's sort of this is what we do um but you kind of fill it in with your your own information um yeah maybe one day i'll refresh that and do another session on the documentation bible perfect um which structure would you recommend for a cloud-based product that only has one version and requires monthly or bi-weekly releases of the docs to customers or users oh gosh um you only have one version of it. Um, I have to. I'd have to think about that a little bit and know a little bit more. But if you just got one version of it, that's actually a really nice situation to be in. And, and Central is really nice for that because our Central documentation only has one version, and so I, you know, generate output with that. Um, and if I only had that gosh, I might just use a really simple structure and bind it directly to something like central. Um, but if you've got multiple authors, of course, I always recommend source control. But yeah, you could probably do something very simple. I'd probably want to talk to this person and find out a little bit more. Yeah. Um, we have time for a couple more questions. Um, the next one is from a user who uses a lot of multimedia in their project that's often updated. Will there be a need for huge amounts of online storage if I start to use a service like Git? Mm. Uh, if you use a service, well, I don't think the, the source control provider is, is going to make a difference. It, it, it really has to do with where you're hosting your output. So if you were hosting, say, a on on central you know you you are uh paying for the space that you have so that is a factor well, what i do i have multimedia in ours too and what i found i used to embed it and so i had the multimedia files there in my project and that took up space but what we found was that we had better control if we linked externally so i'd have like a youtube video it's out there on youtube and i would link to that and i'd have better control if there was like a mistake in in that i could up i could you know change that but my link is kind of going to up to our website so um and then the website has a link to whatever you know youtube we want and you're not taking up space there uh so i found that that shrunk our project quite a bit but yeah, if, who, where, wherever you're hosting, I mean, it depends on the that criteria, what, what, what you're being charged for. But yeah, more files typically means you're paying for more. Cool. We have a lot more other questions coming in. Um, I will pick out one more question. You can question. ask questions about my dogs too. I prefer that. <laughs> well, we'll ask one more question and then we'll follow up with the q a and send that out to everybody okay. um let's see how about okay would you recommend global project linking or a master project structure if using context sensitive help or would you need to learn more yeah i'd need to learn a little bit more about what you're doing but that i mean that's what we do, we do we have i've used in the way that i used to use global project like and i've always used context sensitive help it it doesn't i don't know that it really has an effect on on your structure um it's it's more of the context sensitive help is it being uh integrated into an application a desktop app application because there's one way of doing it there working with your developers as opposed to making it a uh, web-based so you're using either a URL approach or a JavaScript approach in order to, to do that. But I, I don't really think the, the structure, the overall project structure is gonna have much an effect on that. You can pretty much do the context sensitive help regardless. Perfect. <laughs> How old are your dogs? So Gilbert on the left, see, I'm so glad somebody asked that. Gilbert, Gilbert on the left is five and Mabel's five and a half. 
and they're finally they're finally calming down a little bit. <laughs> finally, yeah. they're at, they're at a good age. They're fun, and I brought them into the office with me since they were puppies. Oh. So they've been helping a long time. Perfect. We do have a couple of questions that we weren't able to get to, but we will definitely answer them in the Q&A after and send them out to all registrants. Sure. Sounds mm -hmm. good. I hope those pop-ups that I was getting weren't too <laughs> distracting. <laughs> but uh, it, it happens. I, uh, it, it just in, it just brought up a uh, Skype or whatever uh, that I didn't have open and it just automatically popped it up and started getting messages. So um, yeah, thanks everybody for attending. Um, like I said, this has been recorded, will be sent to you so you can watch it again if you want, um, show your mom. And uh, yeah, we'll send out Q&A to get everybody's uh, questions answered. If you think of questions, just send them still and we'll, we'll make it part of the thing. That's it. Thanks.